I usually pick the Psalms while I'm preparing the message uh, for Sunday morning, and uh, one of those was the song, Living for Jesus, and you know, as we were singing, I thought, you know, what a commitment, really, this song is, is having us to make. Uh, Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to Thee, and uh, you know, we, that's exactly the way we, we should be with our Lord. He is the Lord and Master, and that's what we're looking at this morning, is it's kind of a simple uh, topic, but it's, it's so basic that it is important. You know, a, a sporting team, if they're having trouble, they go back to basics. And as Christians, we need to constantly be going back to basics and looking at just the, the simple truths of, of God's Word. This morning, we're looking at the Christian life. Uh, we're going to be looking at 1 Peter uh, chapter 1. That should be a good uh, notice to you to turn off the sound to your, uh, your phones. Uh, the Lord will probably not call you on the phone, so... 1 Peter chapter 1, in Romans chapter 1 and in 1 Corinthians 1, he says that Christians are called to be saints. In the King James Bible, if you look at that later, you'll see that the words to be are actually in italics. It means they're added to, to help the sense of the English. And so you could actually read it, called saints. God calls us saints. That's who we are. And it doesn't mean you're better than somebody else. It means that you've been placed in God's family. You're God's child. Uh, if you're saved, God has changed something about you. You're a saint. Uh, they say there's saints and there's ain'ts. And uh, saints are those that have the Lord. Uh, in 1 Peter chapter 1, I'm going to start reading in verse 22. We're looking at this subject. What is the Christian life to be? And he gives us a good start here. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth. The flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. If so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. He's talking to Christians there. We're going to stop reading there. He's saying, if you've tasted the Lord, if you've trusted the Lord, he says, uh, there's a different way of living. And uh, where we started there, he's talking about loving each other, loving the brethren. And verse 23 of chapter 1, he's saying it's because we're born again. There's a difference when you've trusted Christ as your Savior. Uh, what is the Christian life to be? Well, we see how it starts in uh, chapter 1, verse 23. It starts by being born again. Now, I've, I've been present at several births. Uh, I've never given birth. Uh, God didn't give men that, that privilege, but um, birth is very traumatic. Uh, I, I think it was our, I can't remember which one of our children uh, was born while a woman in the next room was just screaming. <laughs> and uh, they handed the, wrapped the baby, I think it was Philip, wasn't it? Handed him to me and off they went to take care of that woman screaming in the next room, you know. Uh, birth can be very traumatic. And being born again is, it, it's not just a nothing, it, it's a big deal. Uh, Jesus said, you must be born again. I remember a door knocking one time, a lady said, oh, this foolishness about being born again. I said, well, do you know who said that? Said, Jesus said that. You must be born again. Salvation is the start. It's a change. It's a traumatic event. Now, if you're, if you're young and you're, you kind of grow up in Christianity, it doesn't seem as traumatic as it is. But let me tell you, I don't remember anything about my birth, <laughs> you know, when I was born physically. Uh, but it was, a, it was a big deal. And salvation is, is the same thing. Coming to Christ is the beginning of the Christian life. We become followers of Jesus. There's, there's a verse in Acts uh, 20. Let me just read it to you. And I think it lays out the, the basics here. When he's, He says how they're preaching um, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. 
testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, those, uh, those are uh, important parts of salvation. Repentance, turning from our sin, seeing that we're sinners, turning to God. You know, there's a lot of people in the world who realize they have a problem, but they don't know who to turn to. And, and many of them nowadays are committing suicide. And boy, the devil laughs. It's the old saying, out of the frying pan into the fire. But as when you get saved, you, you see your trouble, you see your sin, and you turn from it to God. And that's where hope is. That's faith. I often say to people, repentance and faith are two sides of the same door. You know, we, we see our sin, but faith says, man, the Lord is... Jesus Christ died for my sin. Uh, I can be born again. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 9, I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You know, the problem most people have is they think they are righteous. God says there's none righteous. No, not one. Wow. We, we must be born again. Uh, in Luke chapter 13 and verse 3, Jesus is talking about... Um, a catastrophe that happened in their day. And people were saying, were those people worse sinners? Is that why God allowed that catastrophe to happen? And Jesus said, I tell you, nay. That, may, that means no, all right? Nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. And then he names another catastrophe of those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell. That would have been big news in their day. Tower fell over and 18 people were killed. Think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, no. Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Listen, bad things don't happen just because people are worse than you. If it happens to you, it's not because you're worse than someone else. We live in a sin-cursed world. And God says, unless we repent, we'll all perish. We're all going to die and give an account to God. And the, the answer is faith. When they asked the disciples, what must I do to be saved? Their answer was believe. And it wasn't just believe, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. There's a lot of people have beliefs, a lot of people have faith, but the only faith that counts is the faith, the faith that's in Jesus Christ. Repent, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. And the, the important thing about faith is who? Paul is able to say, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. See, when we are born again, when we're saved, God does the saving. That's the important thing. Now, that's the opposite of what religion teaches. I often get people who, whose comment to me, if I'm inviting them to church or whatever, is, oh, we're not very religious. I say, that's good. We're not either. Of course, they never know what to say next. <laughs> and, uh, and we're not. You know, we don't have a lot of formalities and things that we do because of, you know, religion. Uh, I'm sure we have some, but uh, we believe God does the saving. It, it's not by works of righteousness which we've done, but according to his mercy that he saves us. Uh, Peter there, uh, in uh, just before what we read, 1 Peter 1, verse 18, says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. See, we're re redeemed not by what we've done, but by the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Uh, 1 Peter 1.23 we read, being born again, not of corruptible seed. Well, that word corruptible comes up, doesn't it? But of incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. It's not by our words, it's not by our thoughts, it's by what God has done, it's by what God has said and done. We're born again uh, by what God has done. Uh, Romans 5, 1 says, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. We're justified, declared righteous by faith in God. God saves us, God justifies us. Uh, there's many other things. 1 Thessalonians 5, he says, the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. That word is completely, W-H-O-L-L-Y. God will, will make a change in your life. And he says, I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It starts, the Christian life starts by being born again. If you haven't had the start, you won't have the continuing. 
I always remember one of the Olympics, the, the man that was favored to win the 100 meters didn't win because he didn't start. He slept in, and he didn't get, even get to the racetrack in time. Uh, you got to start in order to finish. And uh, when you're born again, it can't be hid. Uh, Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 are some of the verses that we often use when we talk to people about salvation. And it uses the word confess. When you're born again, you're going to confess it first to the Lord, but also to others. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And listen to the next verse. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. People are going to know when you're saved. Uh, there's going to be, uh, you're going to tell them. Uh, who was it? I, somebody the other day talked about somebody had made a profession of faith and they told him, now you go tell three people. <laughs> and, but you know, you don't normally have to tell somebody that. Because when you're really saved, man, it's, it's a traumatic, it's an important event in your life. And you tell people about it. Um, it changes you. It exposes you, in a sense. As somebody who is different, it starts by being born again. It continues by, by growth. Now, we read there in 1 Peter 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. When you trust Christ, you're, you're first a babe in Christ. And you, you, get, boy, you get stuck into the milk of the word and you grow. And, uh, you know, the Lord is very, very gracious to us. It continues. Uh, take a look in 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, and let me read starting in verse 3. It talks about the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Verse 3, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. We know the Lord, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. It continues as we add to our faith. You know, we trust the Lord. Uh, repentance and faith, as he, as he talks about. We, we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and then we begin to grow. It's amazing how tiny some of these little babies are, isn't it? And yet they grow. It doesn't seem to make any difference how little they are when they're born. They can get huge, you know. And uh, as Christians, you start off as a babe. But God wants you to add to your faith. He wants you to get into his word and, and be nurtured and, and grow in, in his word. And the Bible, let me continue on here. He says, besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. And to virtue, knowledge. I, I find people a lot of times want to start with knowledge. God says start with faith, and then virtue, then knowledge. Now, you can do them all at once. But uh, more important than knowing is doing. It's good to have both. You need to know what you're doing. Uh, but it's better to do right than to know what's right and not do it. <laughs> uh, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if th these things be in you and abound... They make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, there's the standard, Jesus Christ. That's what we want. We want to be like our Heavenly Father, like our big brother, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the standard. There's a lot of things we could look at here. Uh, Philippians 2.5 says we need to think like Jesus. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, how can we do that? How can we think like Jesus? Well... We can read and think his thoughts. This is his word. He's the word. And he, he's the author of, of scripture. And as we read and think his thoughts, we'll begin to think like him. We should walk like Jesus. Uh, a couple pages to the right from 2 Peter is 1 John uh, chapter 2, verse 6. He that saith he abideth in him. And if you say that you're a Christian, ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. See, that's God's standard for us, is that we think like Jesus, we, we walk like Jesus. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 
uh, verse 21, he said, Even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps. Uh, we sing songs about that. One of them is uh, Footprints of Jesus, you know, walking in his steps. <coughs> You'll never go wrong if you walk like Jesus, if you walk with Jesus. 2 Corinthians 6, he says, Wherefore, come out from among... Uh, I'm ahead of myself here. Uh, Jesus is the standard. We need to be like Jesus, think like him, and walk like him. And trusting Jesus will change us. Uh, 2 Peter 1 and, and verse 4, where we read already, he says that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. You know, when you get saved... God begins a work in you that starts with being born into his family, born again. And he begins to make you like Jesus. That's his goal. And someday, we'll leave all this rubbish behind, and uh, we will be like Jesus. In fact, the, the Bible says that uh, in 1 first, first John, we will be like him. What a blessing. Uh, trusting Jesus changes us. Uh, look at 1 Peter chapter 2 and uh, verse 1. It's the text that we started with. Verse 1 says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. Yeah, I was reading that this week and I thought, you know, that's, that's how most of the people in the world live, is by those things. You, you wouldn't have TV shows without those characteristics. Now, Doyle and I, when we were first married, used to watch I Love Lucy. It was all built on those, those qualities there. She'd, she'd lie or steal or do something, and then the whole show was, you know, the funny ways that she got out of her immorality, basically. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the way the world lives. God says, that's not the way we're supposed to live. That's not the way Jesus lived. He spoke honestly. He did the right thing. Uh, we're, we're to be different than the world. If you look at uh, 1 Peter 2 and verse 9, man, there, this is a great verse. Ye, that's Christians, are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Verse 11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. As Christians, we're on God's side. We're, uh, we're followers of Christ. And the way the world goes is not the way we should want to go. Uh, trusting Jesus changes us. He uses the word there in verse 9, peculiar. And that's come to mean just odd. Oh, that's a peculiar person. A few of those around. Probably been said about us. I don't know. But the word actually has to do with ownership. When it talks about us being God's peculiar people, it means we belong specifically and only to God. I sometimes use my toothbrush as an illustration. Listen, that toothbrush is my toothbrush. It's my peculiar toothbrush. Do not use it. If you come to my house, you, I'll be very hospitable with everything but my toothbrush, all right? <laughs> no, not everything. Anyway, uh, we're God's peculiar people. That means we belong to Him. And He expects and will help us to be like Jesus. The reason being, at the end of verse 9, He says, that ye should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. We're to be people of the light. We're to be people who stand out as different than the world. Let me ask you this morning, uh, where, are, where are you comfortable? Are you comfortable with the world? Or are you comfortable with God and His people? It goes both ways. Uh, I've seen Christians try to live in the world. Very uncomfortable. I've seen non-Christians try to live like they're a Christian. Very uncomfortable. Uh, we had a man some years ago who, after being in our church and making a profession of faith and so on, I think he'd been in our church about two years, he came one time with a box full of everything I'd ever given him. <laughs> he said, Pastor, I'm not coming back anymore. And when I visited him, he said, oh, I feel so much better. Listen, he was a person pretending to be a Christian. Very uncomfortable. Hard, it's a hard way to live. Uh, hypocrisy is always hard to live with. See, trusting Jesus changes us. It makes us at home with God and with his people. He gives us his divine nature. It makes a difference in our life. He says in 2 Corinthians 6, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. In John, 1 John 2, he says, Love not the world. Neither the, Hang on. 
Don't love the world? Well, he's talking about the system. He's not talking about the ground we stand on. And, and by the way, don't, don't get too attached to the ground you're standing on. God's going to burn it up before too long. Uh, love not the world. You know, the world can't understand that statement. Man, that, that's what they're living for. They want to get as much of it as they can. God says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Hang on. I'm in sales. I sell things. I need people to love these things. No, as Christians, we need to be careful. God says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, it's not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of the Father abideth forever. Listen, that's what we want. He's our Heavenly Father. If you've been born again, he's saying, grow. I want you to be like, I want you to be like Jesus. And that's the, the purpose, and that's the plan. Uh, our goal is to be like Jesus. In, in verses 2 and 3 of uh, 1 Peter 2, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Listen, if you've been saved, that, that's what he's talking about. You've tasted that the Lord is gracious. Uh, you, you've had a, uh, you're alive spiritually, and uh, you're going to have a desire for the, for the things of God. The Bible says in 1 John 3, 2, we shall be like him. God wants us to be like him in character. Let me just read you this verse, uh, 1 Thessalonians 3, uh, verses 12 and 13. He says, the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. That's it. He wants us to grow in love. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God. God wants you to have Character like Jesus, to love people. Even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Someday we're going to come with him and, and serve him in, in a wonderful way. We want to be like Jesus in character. We want to be like Jesus in service. You can look at it later, but John 15 talks about bearing fruit. You know, abiding in Christ and, and bearing fruit. <coughs> bearing more fruit. Bearing much fruit. That's what God wants. Uh, that's like Jesus. It starts by faith and salvation. It continues as we add to our faith and we live for Jesus. And let me say this. We, we need to cooperate with God in this growth process, in this Christian life. And, and the way that we cooperate with him, one of them, two of them maybe, I guess, is Bible study and prayer. You know, you don't get any more basic than that, do you? Bible study and prayer. Some, some people have compared it to eating and breathing. That's pretty basic to life, and Bible study and prayer are not optional extras to the Christian life. Let, let me say that. Uh, reading your Bible and praying is not something that you should just do on occasion. It's something you should be committed to. Uh, John 15, 7, he said, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask, prayer, what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Uh, we talked about prayer the other day, and uh, one of the reasons we don't get answers to prayers is, is we're not praying in the Spirit. We're, we're praying to consume it upon our lusts. Sometimes we don't pray at all, and so we don't get any answers. Bible study and prayer. We assist the Holy Spirit's work in our life uh, by doing that. Someone has designed what they call the Disciples' Cross. You might have seen it. It's a, it's a picture of a cross. The, the center is a circle, and it's, it's Jesus. Jesus is the center of our life. That's where it's got to start. And the, the vertical part is prayer and the Bible. We communicate to God. God communicates to us. That, that's the most simple part of Christianity, the most basic part. And, and as Christians, uh, you know, the, like he, we read in 1 Peter 2, as newborn babes, we need to be the ones desiring the sincere milk of the word that we may grow. Sunday nights, we've been using 2 Peter 3.18 as our theme. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, Philippians 4, 6, he says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. The, the, the most basic part of, of growing is your personal walk with God. Let me encourage you to, uh, to make sure that's right. Make sure your personal walk with God is right. The second part is your worship, fellowship, and service in your church. Uh, we talked about the vertical bar of the cross. The horizontal bar is your church and your witness. 
Now, that's the people around you, the, the horizontal. And, and those are so basic to Christianity. Uh, listen, like we read in, in Romans 10, uh, if, if you're saved, you're not going to be ashamed. You're going to tell others. And if you're saved, you're going to love your brothers and sisters in Christ. You're going to have a commitment uh, to what God has called you to. You know, the Bible says in Matthew 16, 18, Christ loves the church. I, I feel like a lot of Christians define away the church. Oh, yeah, you know, we're all part of God. Well, listen, when you're saved, it's true. You're a part of God. But God says, don't forsake the assembling of yourself together. That's a church. A church is people. It's not this building. We can meet anywhere. Uh, it's people. It has a structure. And, and God, God describes it. Don't define it away. You can believe in the universal church. That's okay. But let me tell you, when the universal church meets, it'll be local. <laughs> universal church ain't meeting today. It's local churches that are meeting. You need to be a part of one. When the universal church meets, we'll all meet together. And I won't be the pastor. Thank God for that. <laughs> uh, I'm looking forward to it. We are to assemble. Uh, the verse, one of them is Hebrews 10, verse 25. He says, forsake not the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Man, we see them assembling in the book of Acts. And we get closer to the Lord coming. He says, it's more important that we assemble. We are to assemble. Uh, let me just make a bold statement here. If you don't have a church, or if you're not faithful in your church, it's because you don't love the Lord like you should. Let, let's just be honest about it. If you're not doing what you should as far as the local church goes, it, you can use whatever excuse you want. But you need to love the Lord. Listen, it's through our church that we're baptized and identify outwardly with Christ. It's through our church that we're instructed and encouraged and rebuked. Listen, every one of us have times when we need to be rebuked. And we need to be encouraged. And we need to be instructed. And we need to do it for others and receive it. It's through our church that we pray for each other. Listen, you need a group of people that know you so well, they know how to pray for you. It's through our church that we use our spiritual gifts and serve. Mostly. Mostly. It's through our church that we send missionaries. Listen, that's, that's God's plan. It's through our church that we give. It's through our church that we disciple the converts that we win. He says, add to your faith. And I would encourage you, and God would encourage you, be faithful. The Christian life, Colossians describes as Christ in you, the hope of glory. What a blessing. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Our personal walk with him, our walk with other believers, it's a walk of fellowship. We walk with God. We walk with His people. I don't believe you can be right with God if you aren't right with God's people. Listen, it's, it's just part of our Christian life. Your Christian life will have ups and downs. I know mine does. But it won't be because God changes or God is not faithful. All right? You'll have plenty of ups and downs. But it's our reasonable service, if we're saved, to yield ourselves to the Lord. Let me ask you, are you saved. If you stood before God and he said, why should I let you into my heaven? What would your answer be? The Bible says the only way into heaven is through God's son, Jesus Christ, the precious blood of Christ. If you're saved, are you faithful? Are you walking with the Lord on a personal basis? Are, are you faithful enough in your church to be trusted with a ministry? That, that's my goal for everyone who comes to our church. As a pastor, my goal for every person who comes is that at some point they'll, they'll be faithful enough that we can trust them with the ministry. Think about that. That, that should be every one of us. Are you, are you saved? Are you faithful? The Christian life, it flavors everything we do, everything we think, everything we are. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, He's the Lord. And he has a, a purpose in every, every breath you take, every beat of your heart, and uh, wants you to bring glory to him. This morning we're going to end with the song, uh, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. It's page 160 in the hymnal if, if you need it there. Uh, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Uh, that's our goal this morning. We want to know the Lord. Uh, we want to be saved. We want to add to our faith. We want to be growing in him.
as we sing, maybe you need to, maybe there's just some areas the Lord has brought to your attention, just by prayer you need to take care of it. And maybe you need to be saved. I'll be down here at the front, and uh, we'd love to have somebody take the scriptures and show you how to trust Christ this morning. Or maybe you've been saved, need to follow him in believer's baptism. Uh, whatever your need might be. Let's, let's stand together. I, 